This old-time radio program was originally aired live, long before the advent of high fidelity. As a result, you may detect an occasional surface noise or volume drop due to transmission problems so common to old radio. We hope, however, that any variance in audio quality will not take away from your pleasure in listening to this, one of the all-time favorite shows. from Jim Morrison of the Doors about the most exciting new magazine of our day. This is Jim Morrison of the Doors suggesting you can light your own fires and open your minds by turning on to a new magazine called Cheetah. If you can't cop a copy from a friend who has one, it's now in your neighborhood newsstand with the kind of stories and pictures that really say something. There's Mama Cass on a field of daisies advertising flower power. There's a profile of Brian Wilson, the genius head of the Beach Boys. There's a report on the Boston scene from someone who's obviously been there, and more. It's a magazine with soul. Cheetah, for all you who are willing to let words and ideas ignite your imagination. Hey, Olive, thank you so much for being on the show. I really, really appreciate it, and uh, I'm excited to tell some of our listeners about your wonderful artwork and, and just about you in general. Hell yeah. Thanks for having me on, Jeremy. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> so let's start, I guess, uh, the the simplest way is let's just have you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and uh, you know a little bit about growing up. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as you know, I'm an artist and a model currently. Um, I grew up in um, Utah. I was born in Portland, Oregon, grew up in Utah, so I really consider Utah my home. Okay. Uh, and, yeah, I moved away uh, when I was a teenager and just started making art like a crazy person, and that's what I've been doing ever since. <laughs> right on, right on. Yeah. So, I mean, L- L.A. is such a different place than Utah. I mean, I, I was uh, yeah. I, li- yeah, I lived in Utah, I think, for about four months, and that uh, it was different. It's, I mean, great people and uh, some, some uh, wonderful, you know, farmland and – and those bunkers, you know, you ever driven on the, the highways there and you see those, they're like <laughs> above ground bunkers they're trying to sell for fallout bunkers? Yeah, yeah. Well, you said you just said bunkers. So my, my like, family goes by the name bunkers, which is so funny. Not, wow. Like, not specifically, but, like, my real, my relatives do. And I was like, oh, my God, the bunkers. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. I'm the fall- what you're talking about. Um, That's those, so the, crazy. The bunkers that are over top ground, yeah. Man, so, you know, in, in Utah uh, – you grew up in like an RLDS community, right? FLDS, yeah. FLDS, sorry, my bad. So okay, tell us, uh, I mean, a little bit about just, you know, briefly about that situation and, and how that contributed to you, uh, you know, becoming a creative person. Like wh- what was the inspiration in that where, where you ended up having creativity as an outlet? Yeah, uh, so, yeah, I grew up FLDS. Um, I was actually never baptized Mormon. I okay. uh, to the gospel when I was eight, but I was still growing up in a very like cloistered FLDS and LDS environment. Um, so it was like I might as well have been baptized. I just didn't take sacrament, and um, it was it was very interesting. It felt very oh uh, oppressive to me. I didn't I didn't appreciate it at all. Um, and I I'm still like I'm glad that I left, even though now I see like how it changed me and made me the person I am. Right. So I have to, appreciation for it now as an adult but back then I was just like dude I need out of here like they won't let me like because I'm a girl they won't let me do things and it was it was just pretty traumatic um I ended up leaving home at 16 I was like peace out I can't handle this I can't handle these rules um they thought I was crazy they thought I was practicing witchcraft Uh, (laughs) okay (laughs) that's always the first thing they go to right exactly especially because you know I'm a girl and I'm kind of like stubborn girl and I was also a very intelligent girl. 
and, you know, I read a lot and I drew a lot of pictures and I had like this dark edgy thing going on Mm -hmm. and they were like, uh, definitely devil worshiper where I was really just a very normal, if not, you know, somewhat extra creative teenager. (laughs) So, but, so with that, I mean, what's your earliest memory then of, of dealing with adversity? That's a good question. Um, you know, it was just always little things. Um, I do, you know, there's so many, like, yeah, so many little things. I do remember the first time that I was made very aware of the fact that I was like a girl and I was not allowed to like show body parts. Like I was a very small child and I was at, um, this like family gathering and we were doing bobbing for apples and I was like super young by the way Mm. like younger than eight and um and you know all the boys were taking off their shirts to do the bobbing for apples and I took my shirt off and all the men like freaked out and the women oh no and it was like so extreme and I was so deeply ashamed and they're like girls can't do that girls can't do that and I'm looking around at all my boy cousins and I'm like well, they're doing exactly what I was doing, like, right. you know, but because I was, you know, a girl, it was, like, so bad, and, um, yeah, just, you know, things like that, and just, you know, we had a very strict idea of what girls were allowed to do and what girls' purpose was, and that was to be, you know, the good, like, good and virtuous and pure, which usually meant very, like, ignorant of outside society, and, um, yeah. you know, get married early become and become a mother. That was literally, like, what, like, we were supposed to be in our happy home our entire lives until we went to our husband's happy home. And then we would create a happy home for children. And that was all that we, we, you know, it's not like that's a small thing to do. That's huge creating a family, but it's the one option we had. And that was not what I was looking for. Oh, it's certainly not for everybody. And it it almost becomes like a, a a mental prison. I mean, it it basically is a mental prison, you know, like I, yeah, I want a family one day, but I want a family on my terms. <laughs> well, know? yeah, and that's not really unfair of you to feel, you know. That's yeah. a completely reasonable thing. Yeah, and it's, it's very sane, and it's I, I wanted to explore the world, and then I wanted a family. Because if I had a family when I was that age, like a lot of girls were getting married prior to being 18, mm-hmm. and, I, you know, they didn't see anything of the world, and I just, I think I would have been one of those psycho mothers that, like, burned the house down if that had been me. Right, right. Like, I well, think I would have snapped. But now, because I've had the opportunity to go out and around, then I will make that choice when I see fit, and it will be a good one. Well, and and the the positive side to this is going through that time and that adversity did lead you to kind of um, hone this alter ego of Olive. Right. And, you know, what was that process like? Well, that was really interesting, too. Um, yeah, it's full of good questions. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Olive is an imaginary friend I had as a kid, and she was, like, the bad one, right? She did all the bad stuff, and, and whenever I did anything wrong, they'd be like, you know, you know, like, why did you do that? And I'd be like, no, Olive did it. And Olive was kind of like, I don't know, like the more brave, a little bit, like, she was meaner and she was edgier and she was braver. And I remember like as a, basically a toddler creating this like character. Wow. And so when I moved out, when I was 16, I didn't want to go by my real name because I was, you know, technically a runaway. Mm-hmm. And um, so I just started going by Olive. Like I was, some people called me that occasionally anyway, but then I, I started like really off officially going by that name and I, I wanted, when I moved out, I wanted to fully embrace, you know, that side of myself that was like an adventurer and a creative. So I thought that maybe if I took on the name of Olive, I would absorb some of that like bravery and, you know, like almost like a street smart vibe that I didn't have. Well, the funny thing is that in reality, if you strip it down, it was things that were there all along. It's right. just that it it permitted you, I guess, in a more... Uh, at that time, understandable way of how you know how to get right. those results. Well, you know, you think about it, and names have power. And yeah, so yeah. I grew up being called a certain name that you know my parents called me, and it was like it was just like everything. All the expectations were on this girl, but when I mm. came to Olive, there were no expectations on Olive, other than what I wanted. <laughs> right, right. So. Now, this, as you got the Olive persona, this led you to kind of foray for the first time into artistic photography. 
Right. And yeah, I was doing artwork under the name Olive Alexander at the time. Okay. And then uh, when I started modeling, I went by Glass Olive. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, everything has been uh, – uh, all of has been in all of my stage names. <laughs> but now, so you're 16, you're a runaway, and try to think back. What – you know, the very first moment that you actually, can, you know, understood that you were away and that you were free in this way that you had always dreamed of. Right. Uh, what, you know, what was that moment like and, and what preceded it? I think the best word for that feeling was exhilaration mm -hmm. because it wasn't just plain excitement and it, like happy excitement and it wasn't complete fear, but it was somewhere in between. It was like going on a, like even just walking down a city block for me was like going on a roller coaster ride because it was like so new and I was just, it was so exciting and new and crazy and like nobody was watching to tell me how I needed to do things differently, you know? So it was, like I was in control and it was, I was very aware of that. And it was like a combination of terrifying and exciting. When I first ran away, as I was leaving, it was just like intense um, anger, fear. You know, there was a lot of stuff going on that was like motivating me to leave. And then once I, you know, actually got on the road and got into like cities that I had never seen and was doing things on my own that I had never done, it became like a whirlwind of opportunities, I guess. And it was Well, it's, cool. it's like you were reborn, really. Right. I mean, it was, it was, exactly, it was completely reborn. And I was anonymous and I was, you know, it was, it was, I could do anything I wanted. <laughs> so. so you get out of Utah and where's the, the next state that, uh, you know, you wind up and, and how so? Um, so I went, uh, first I went and stayed in Salt Lake City for a short period of time. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I went to a lot of different places in a short period of time. I want to say the next move was um, Oklahoma. Okay. And then from there, I drove to Oklahoma. <laughs> wow. That's an unusual, unusual choice, <laughs> Utah yeah. to Oklahoma. <laughs> yeah, I was with my boyfriend at the time, and we decided okay. to go take a job in Oklahoma. Or he did. and. Um, and then we drove there. We, we hadn't slept for uh, the day before we left the, for the trip. Oof, okay. And then we had to get there like as quickly as possible. So Do you remember what kind of car it was? It was just some normal, I don't a know. Basic, okay, okay. Yeah, it's just like a basic bitch car. I don't know. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I, uh, it was, um, like all the four doors that you see, um, I think it was a Honda, but okay, anyway. okay. But not like yeah. an old station wagon type movie. No, it wasn't. <laughs> no, or Cool. That we did have one of those later on, but um, no, this this one was just the standard car that every 16 year old high school kid that you know that my boyfriend was gets when he's <laughs> right when they're <laughs> like, 16 yeah. for 800 dollars with your Dairy Queen money. Right, exactly. So uh, we drove to Oklahoma in that, and we were so tired that um, when I would start falling asleep at the wheel, he would like nudge me, and then we'd change oh. places. And then he would fall asleep at the wheel. I would nudge him, and we would change places. Wow. And, like, we almost died many times. Yeah, don't try this at home. <laughs> oh, my God, please, for the love of God, don't try this at home. I almost, because I didn't know how to drive. So oh, I even tired. better. <laughs> and I was also kind of dyslexic, so I kept mixing up the gas and the brake and left and right. And Oof. so I almost ran 60 miles an hour into the fence of a military base in, like, I don't know where where, where we even were, somewhere wow. near Oklahoma. Um, I want to say Georgia, but I'm not sure if that's, like, correct at all. But anyway, Well, yeah. I mean, if that would have happened, maybe they could have rebuilt you like the $6 billion man, you know? Right. I could have become a I cyborg. Have greatest, like, yeah, cyborg battler. <laughs> <laughs> so then, all right, so – how did that, the anxiety of that situation and kind of being in the unknown, you know, how did that not overwhelm you? I guess you oh, had the did. support, you know, of your boyfriend, but. It did completely overwhelm me. Like now looking back at it too, I think I didn't realize at the time how overwhelmed I was like on a consistent basis. Right, right. Like going grocery shopping and talking to the cashier was a nightmare for me. Like I didn't, I, I didn't like have a, I was good at things, but it took me a while to learn. Like, counting change and, and money out when I went to the cashier was, a, like, so bad that I wouldn't be able to, like, figure out how much to give the cashier. Um, 
driving was scary. Talking to people was scary. I was incredibly naive. So holding a conversation was kind of a nightmare in like a group setting. Yeah. Um, like they would be like, you know, anybody who was like, Hey, have you seen princess bride? And I'd be like, who is that? <laughs> like, like, who is this princess bride? I want to meet them. Right. Um, so then what, you know, you had relied on things like a drawing and painting when you, you know, were growing up and you were in Utah. So at what point did creativity, I mean, were you always still drawing? Did you always still keep painting as you were on the road, as you were going between, you know, Oklahoma to, to uh, you know, next, where did you go after Oklahoma? Oh, we just drove, God, I don't even know, like, exactly what the timeline was. We went all over the West. Um, okay. We mostly, Oklahoma, I think, is the furthest east we went. Okay. Um, we we did go to Ohio, actually, though. We lived in Ohio for a minute. I, like, you hit all the, all the O's. Yeah, yeah. Like, my boyfriend and I at the time traveled around a lot. Um, And then I believe they transitioned to become a woman soon after that, and it became very complicated to, like, maintain the relationship. Oh, wait, 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 wait. wait. You and your boyfriend, you mean? So he transitioned to being a woman? Yeah. And I I don't know the pronoun to say for that, you know, this person because they haven't told me. So I just got it, got it, got it. You know, my boyfriend at the time. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so they and it became like really complicated. That started in Ohio. We moved back to Utah. Then it got even more intense. Uh, hormones like are when you're transitioning and taking hormones. Like from what I've you know experienced with with this person, it was like very complicated. And our I can't even imagine. Yeah. Yeah, our relationship didn't last. I, we tried. <laughs> Well, but but so was was creativity even then? I mean, were you always still creating to try oh. and escape? Yeah, always. That was super important. Okay, so you get you get back home to Utah, and then uh, you begin art modeling from there, and that leads you to Portland. Yeah, so I moved back to uh, Logan, Utah. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is actually after uh, my ex and I uh, joined a band and we were traveling the West for that, too. After all of that happened, um, we, the band disbanded, if you will. And the band disbanded, I, okay. Yeah. And I That's a great that, band name. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we moved back to um, Logan, Utah. Or I moved back to Logan, Utah. And um, I was just, like, selling artwork, uh, like, out of my old suitcase that I sold all my artwork out of. Um and, like, making little bits of money at events or, you know, at sidewalk sales, things like that. Okay. Uh, and then somebody offered me, like, 20 bucks to model for them, and I was like, that's awesome. I can get, like, you know, 20 coffees with $20. So, and so I, I did that. It was, it was such a blast. I, art modeling for the first time was, like, so natural, so fun, and, and just, like, freeing. Um and you had never really done it before. So you being, you know, like you said, so shy and reserved and, and not being able to really count change at a convenience store, where where did you find that motivation and that ability to to be, you know, first of all, even comfortable in your own skin in front of the camera, but also to be comfortable nude? I have no idea. <laughs> it just happened. Just go with it kind yeah, of thing. Absolutely. So, you know, because I'm sure that there's going to be uh, people listening that do want to get into modeling, the dream of doing modeling and, and acting here in L.A. And so I think one of the biggest uh, hurdles to get over is really putting that first foot forward and putting yourself out there and being open to, you know, possible rejection or, or possible job offers and, and getting past that whole anxiety of right. what if. Well, yeah, I mean, there's so many what ifs. That's why, you know, when people come to me and say, like, I want to be a model, like, help, you know, I'll give them the tools. But Mm. honestly, it's a combination of, like, bullheadedness, for Mm. one. You have to, like, I'm not a standard model type. Like, I'm really not. And so I had to go and, like, break some walls down to get some opportunities. Just keep doing it and doing it and doing it until you finally make it work. And you have to be okay with being very poor for a very long time. Right, right. And there's just, like, there's so many obstacles, like creepy photographers, uh, cancellations, um, traveling constantly. Like, it can be really amazing, but the constant travel is exhausting. You know, there's just so many variables that I think people don't realize when they're thinking about, you know, the they want to start a career in modeling. 
Right. Well, we see the the fame and the pretty pictures, but none right. of the the loneliness and the traveling Dude. behind the scenes. And... It is a tough fucking. Oh, can I swear? <laughs> of course, please. Okay. It is a tough job. Like I, it's not just standing there and look pre- looking pretty. That's that's the fun part. <laughs> right. Right. But you got to hustle. It sounds like. Yeah, you got to hustle hard, just like any other freelance career. So you start modeling and. Does that, I mean, you do it your first time, and how quickly would you say until you were, you know, doing your first shoot outdoors to doing it full time? Oh, um, well, I was essentially homeless when I was doing it, so it became a full-time job right away. But when I (laughs) had nothing else I could be doing, you know? Right, Um, right. I I would sell, like, one piece of artwork a week for, like, $5, so that wasn't really, like, a thing. I was, like, living with my friend or in a tent sometimes in the woods, so... um, I started making it like my full-time job um, after I created a model mayhem, which was maybe a week after my first shoot. Okay. Um, and I wasn't going to start a model mayhem. I was like, I'm not a model, you know, that's like dumb, but uh, I, I just decided to do it. My friend kept telling me to, so I did. And then I started getting people wanting to like book me for shoots in Portland out of nowhere. Wow. I, I didn't even put my location as Portland and I was like, okay, I guess I'm moving to Portland. <laughs> but now, so you don't really have that much money saved up, so you got to now figure out a way to get to Portland to get the work. Yeah, well, I half hitchhiked and then half caught rides with friends. And then I also, um, you know Craigslist Rideshare? Uh, yeah, I recall that. I mean, yeah. I don't, that doesn't exist anymore, right? I don't may- think it does. But yeah, at okay, okay. a period of time, like, it was actually a viable way of getting places. You would obviously have to be careful. You couldn't just jump into anybody's car. But, like, you would meet with a person for coffee first, you know, have your friend go with you, that sort of thing. Um, and, yeah, so I jumped in the car with this guy who was also going to Portland. He was super nice, hipster dude. Um, and, I, yeah, it was, like, I wouldn't do that now. I don't recommend, like, <laughs> you know, but he, it was, I was very fortunate that I never had bad experiences doing that sort of thing. Um, and yeah, we had a great time. Like we would stop along the way and like visit roadside attractions. And at one point we like ran through a grape vineyard in the Hudson. Um, like, was it the Hudson? Is that the one in Oregon? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> and, okay. and it was so fun. And then we got to Portland and I started modeling full time. Um, yeah, it was cool. So you're modeling full time and you're traveling all over the world. I mean, what, because it seems like it was such a short amount of time from from the uh, the age where you're kind of getting away from your roots and becoming your own person. You find this passion of modeling that you're succeeding at, and then all of a sudden you're you're seeing the world. I mean, it's it's such a contrast from being stuck on a, a little uh, you know ranch. To right. <laughs> seeing these incredible sights, you I'm know. I'm pretty sure my relatives think that I like hopped into some kind of wormhole. <laughs> right, right, right. Like, well, what just happened? <laughs> so, I mean, where where did you get to travel? Well, um, you know, I was actually this made me think of the first time I was able to travel for modeling, which mm-hmm. was so exciting because in you know in your head you always think like if I could hit this. Uh, this level, then I will be a successful whatever. And so my thing was like, if I if I get to travel for modeling, that means I'm like a real model, you know. And um, I think I flew to like, um, what is it? Like some podunk town in Oregon. Like they just had a little like you know, puddle jumper kind of plane. And I went out to Bend's, I think, for the weekend. Oh wow. And I was so excited. I was on the plane, and the person next to me, they're like, oh, what are you going out to Ben for? And it's so, so funny because I remember looking at them and being like, I'm going to model. (laughs) (laughs) Right. And they're like, okay, honey. (laughs) (laughs) So then, so, so you go to Ben, but then, I mean, where, where was the first place you left, would you say, internationally? So, um, I was, (laughs) this is actually the best story. I'm so glad you asked about this. Um, So I was, hired um with my friend floofy her that's her modeling name okay uh, on instagram she's great um her and i were hired by this um belgian count who owns a cookie factory count chocula sounds fake but it's real <laughs> <laughs> and um so he owns a cookie factory he's a belgian count he cannot um like 
I know his name, but like I can't say his name because it was like he he couldn't tell anybody that he, you know, shot nude art models. Weird. So, okay. Okay. So he had like basically unlimited money, and he was like, "I'm going to fly you guys out to, um, you know, uh, uh, Belgium and uh, France and England, wherever you want to go. I'll put you up in all these different places, and then I just want to shoot with you like a couple of times." And he was a super friendly, very polite, like no fishy business going on. Wow. Um, we stayed at this like what was it called? Um, we were in Bruges at the palace, the Duke's Palace Hotel, which is like. It's exactly what it sounds like. It was the uh, a palace of a duke. It was amazing. That's um, crazy. And he came and he would shoot with us at the location because it was like at the hotel because it was so beautiful in the room. So was um, he like a photographer as well, or he had his own team doing the uh, the actual photography? He was just a, he was his own photographer. Like he okay, okay. Would just come with his camera and he shot beautiful work, um, very artistic, uh, like almost painterly. Wow. And you would think, like, hearing this, you're like, oh, a duke or a count is flying you over, like, and shooting you in the hotel room. Like, when she first told me about that, I was like, so he's looking for escorts? Yeah, it's like hostile almost or something. Right. But it was was completely legit. She had shot with him a bunch of other times, like, very friendly. It was just so fun. And I felt like, so I went there. I went to Bruges. We shot there. Um, and we shot in his cookie factory as well. Oh man! <laughs> Which is really cool. And um, then what kind of cookies? Uh, they were uh, like butter cookies. Oof! Yeah, get in my mouth. Mm. I don't like butter cookies, but he. All has- right, well, it's great. It's been great having you on. So. <laughs> <laughs> the end. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah. So then after that, I went to Paris during the. Um, the terrorist attacks actually is when it happened. Oh, okay. So okay. we were like quarantined essentially inside of one of my shoot locations with the photographer and the team, um, and we could hear the gunshots. Like it was insane. Oh, um, so everyone was just losing their shit at that point. Right, and it, the the attack was going on right nearby. Like it was below us. Wow. Um, so we were just like sitting in the in you know the um studio space. Like, we were all just sitting against the wall underneath the window because we we didn't want to get too close to the window, but we wanted to hear what was going on. Mm. We were probably, like, 12 stories up, so it wasn't as dangerous. But we were like, we don't know what's going on. There can be tons of people with guns out there. Right, right. So Man, what a weird there. experience. Yeah, and then uh, after they let us out, like, there was cops, you know, the mil- military everywhere with their guns and um it was just a very interesting experience, and there were riots going on, too, at the same time. So I had, like, really hard time getting to the airport. It was still an amazing trip. Like, I loved it, but it was a very unusual time to go to Paris for the first time. Right. Well, I mean, that's the whole thing, though, is any any fashion model's, you know, dream is to be shooting in Paris. Right. So, you know, you're happened. living out this experience, and then shit just goes upside down. Right. I was on a riot that happened in the subway there, in the metro, and we had to evacuate because, like, rioters had gotten onto the train tracks and were trying to tip the train over, and it was like... Oh, my God. Violent. And I grabbed my bag. I, I couldn't speak French fluently, so I, I was, like, you know, trying in bad French to ask what was going on. Finally, I felt them rocking the train. I just grabbed my bags and ran back up the stairs. Yeah, probably a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, as you're traveling the world and you're, you're, you know, pretty much immersed in this modeling, you know, uh, high-end modeling lifestyle, did you continue to ha- ever have self-doubt? Did you ever continue to feel like, oh, my God, they're going to find out, like, I'm a fraud. I, I, I'm just a, a girl from Utah. You know, did you ever have yeah. any kind of moments? You know, I think I still have those moments sometimes. <laughs> and and how do you, you know, how do you face off against those? Well, you just keep doing the thing. I mean, like, I don't, I, you know, it's my, it's, it's my passion and I do it and I love it, but it's also like my job. And no matter what I think about myself in one moment, like I can't just stop doing the thing because I need to you know, get groceries. <laughs> right, right. So I, I don't know. I tell myself, like, I, I'll have, like, I have had and I still sometimes have moments of, like, they're going to think that I'm just, like, some dumb girl that's trying to, like, make this work and I'm obviously not, like, the look or whatever. And um, usually I'll stop and, like, take a few deep breaths and 
try to access my uh, uncrazy side (laughs) where I I feel confident or I I at least feel like powerful. And I don't know. I, I guess I'm just really stubborn. I just keep doing it anyway. Yeah, but you know what? Sometimes that works. You know, it's just it's, yeah. it's one of those things where, you know, this this is a show that I I started that is for people that are you know struggling per, perhaps with withdrawal or perhaps uh, relapsing in their recovery or or are going through you know a bad breakup or a, an ill a physical or mental illness, and you know maybe they're just running through their thoughts in their head and they they need a little yeah. distraction they need some relief and right so I, I you know I like talking to guests that have different passions that have different suggestions on ways to get through adversities, you know, that what works for you. And so that's what it's interesting to hear. I want to create more than I want to do literally anything else in my life. And I think that that's what gets me through those moments is that like, I want it more than anything, like creating art to me and like making cool shit is the most important part of my entire like person as like a living person on earth. That's what I do best. And no matter what, even if they did discover I was a fraud, say they found out there came out a press release tomorrow that said I was a fraud. (laughs) I would still keep creating because that's what I do. That's right. Yeah. And that's, and that's your way also of, uh, of coping almost with any, you know, any anxiety that, that develops. Right. So to backtrack a little bit, so you're traveling around the world, and you did some traveling by yourself as well, though, that wasn't oh, job-related. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, a lot of it's job-related, but I also made time in that to make sure that I got to sightsee and, and you know, do my own exploring. Okay, so, and so when you did get your, your first chance to, to pick, you know, non-job-related, when you're like, all right, I'm going to pick somewhere to go that I want to see that, I, you know, this is where I want to go, where was it? Right. Uh, oh, so actually, uh, when I I had gotten out of a really bad breakup and I was feeling really shitty about myself, like the person had kind of like broken me down and I felt very bad, just bad about myself. And so I started this thing where once a month I would travel somewhere new or do something new just for me and I had to go alone. So um, one of my trips that I think I'm the most proud of, it costs a little bit of money, but that's okay, you know. It's well, yeah, so I mean, you can't, they can't bury you with it, right? Right. right. Uh, I went dog sledding in the Arctic. That's crazy. For a week. Um, wow. It was incredible. I took a lot of photos, which I will be, like, making into a zine at some point. That's cool. But, uh, yeah, I you know the book, uh, The Golden Compass? Mm-hmm, yeah. So um, Lyra, the girl, the main character, is somebody that I really relate to. Okay. Um, and she went to a place called Svalbard and went, like, dog sledding there. And I remember reading that and being like, oh, this guy makes up the best names, you know, of places. <laughs> <laughs> and then I Googled Svalbard, and it was a real place. And so uh, I had no idea. So I booked tickets there. <laughs> so how did – what's the, the flight like? You fly from what? You flew from L.A. to – I mean, there had to be, like, a connection. Well, yeah. So uh, I planned an entire trip around it. I went in February because that's my mm. birth month which okay. is a really interesting time to go. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, so I flew in to, I want to say England. Yeah, I flew into England. Um, and then I actually did do a couple of shoots there because it paid for the trip, and so it made it nice. Yeah, there you go. Why not? Um, yeah, and then, uh, for, but I, it was only like two, so it was very, you know, simple. I went to Nottingham. Okay. Uh, I was, I kissed the Robin Hood statue on uh, Valentine's Day. He was my Valentine's <laughs> I got really drunk at the uh, Nottingham Bar. The um, the old trip to Jerusalem is the oldest pub in England, and it's in the side of Nottingham Castle. Like, like wow. Robert actually went there. So I got really, really drunk there. When it was really fun. So I'm, yeah. So that was a good night. And then when um, you say Robin Hood, I still think of the cartoon fox. Yeah. Right. Maybe. You know. maybe he actually just was a fox. Yeah. But, <laughs> uh, and then after that, um, I went to Paris. Um. And then from Charles de Gaulle Airport, I took a, like, skipper plane to um, Oslo, stayed in Oslo for one night. And then I took another plane even further up north to a place called Tromslo in Norway, which is a very interesting place because the sun doesn't ever seem to leave sunrise, like, level. Oof, that sounds awful. It was very interesting. Like, I was um, kind of permanently exhausted. I was I, I was glad that I had time to adapt before I just went straight to Svalbard. 
because it I did, had no idea the effect on my energy that having like the sun like that would be. Oh, I can imagine, yeah. yeah and so plus just the traveling. Right, right. Yeah. And each time I got onto a plane it kept getting smaller, you know, like right. up there every time it was like more of a puddle jumper. So um and then from there I um while I was in Tromso, I got like pizza and went to Toys R Us. And then because <laughs> that was close to the airport. And then um I got onto a, a tiny plane that as we're walking in, they were like, by the way, there's a rabies outbreak on Svalbard right now, just to be aware. And I'm like, great, great time to be going dog sledding. Dog sledding, yeah. <laughs> um, so I get onto this tiny plane going to Svalbard, um, and we land on this absolutely terrifyingly small uh, um, airport. And <laughs> Yeah, and it was already nighttime, and it was uh, about negative 25 degrees when we landed. Oof. Which was also, yeah, it was a little shocking. And then it got colder through the night. But I, I was staying at a hostel. It was really fun. Um, we, I, I went out the next morning dog sledding. It was just a great experience. And everybody was so friendly. I love Norwegians. They're yeah, just- there's, they're supposed to be some of the happiest and friendliest people on earth. Like every <laughs> year consistently they're yeah. voted, you know, amongst the top. They're just, like, they have perfected the simplicity and this, like, earthiness to their characters where they're just, like, happy, simple people, and I couldn't appreciate that more. Do you think that if you had to, that you could live in a a place like that 24-7 where you're, you know, moving around on dog sled, it's cold as hell all the time, and, uh, you know, a little bit more desolate than you're used to? You know, I actually, uh, they accept um, anybody in uh, Svalbard because they have such a, a small population that you can literally just get, a, uh, you can just move to Svalbard. Like, wow. So I had the opportunity and I turned it down. So I guess that means, no, I wouldn't be able to. But I, I wonder, think- yeah, I wonder if you get a passport then uh, for entry into the European Union. You know what I mean? I wonder how that would work. That'd if that, you get, you, by Norway? yeah, so, you know, you get, you get your, uh, your citizenship there or your visa there. And I wonder if that would permit you to like live in Paris alternatively. I mean, that would be amazing. Right. That might be like the sneak, the back door way to do it. Yeah. That's a good but, point. So the dog, like these, the, I don't, what's it like being on the dog sled? Oh, I loved it. It was, uh, I, I could do it like all the time. I had such a blast and it was difficult. Like it it was a, such a challenge, but it was like positive challenge, you know, and the dogs were incredible and you have to be um, very dominant with them. Mm-hmm. Otherwise they like won't do what you say. And so the moment that your dogs start disrespecting you is the moment that you need to get new dogs. Um, like one of the guys, the the lead dog peed on him just like and while they were taking a break, peed on him in the, uh, the tour guide, we had a, a father and daughter and then the tour guide and then me. And the tour guide was like, we have to get you new dogs. We can't have you continue. Like, they will attack you. Wow. Yeah, like, if the leader of the the train of dogs, you know, the sled, is disrespecting you, then you have no respect from that group of dogs. Right. They're all going to follow suit. Yeah. Interesting. point, the dogs tried to, like, uh, be more dominant than the tour guide, and they started fighting with each other and fighting with him. And he, it was, (laughs) it was like a, a literal dog pile of dogs fighting. He jumped in and started swinging fists with them. What? And like maintain dominance. And they, he wasn't like, they're huge muscular dogs. He wasn't like beating a puppy. Right, right, right. And uh, he was able to maintain discipline with the dogs by winning the fight. <laughs> like, Weird. Yeah. That sounds like some <laughs> some Chuck Norris type legend, you know? He was awesome. I like, I brought a, a golden compass with me. <laughs> like, okay, not, okay. Not like paraphernalia from the book, but I went online, found a vintage golden compass because mm. I wanted to have a compass on me anyway. Um, That's pretty cool. And, yeah, because it would work when my phone froze. Right. Um, I gave it to him at the end of the trip. I was like, I think you need this. <laughs> he was so stoked. <laughs> he, he can build it. He can put it on the back of one of the dogs. Yeah. <laughs> like instrument instrument cluster in a car. Yeah. So... You okay? So you traveled around. You you're back in the U.S. and uh, there was a short time that you moved back to Portland, right? I know I kind of we got ahead of ourselves a little bit, but I want to backtrack because you yeah, were yeah. living you were living in uh, was it Portland or was Seattle in the picture as well? No, I've never lived in Seattle. Okay, I, so so just I, Portland. Portland. 
So you go to Portland, and you were actually working for a circus, right? I was, yeah, the Wanderlust Circus. That's something else. Now, see, this is another thing that is just, it's just not a normal thing that you hear because <laughs> it's such a, it's such a weird esoteric kind of, you know, just the, the circus life and that like the wanderlust really is the perfect word for it. Um, yeah. So, you know, what, what's that like? Well, um, I, I started hanging out with the circus because I was dating the strong man and the mm. our head of the, he was also the head of the acrobatic troupe. Um, and after they were about to go on tour, and their uh, wardrobe stylist and designer just like bounced, mm-hmm. and they needed they needed one. So I was like, you know, I could do it. I have experience. I didn't have experience, by the way. I just because <laughs> I wanted to join the circus. Um, so I could, you know, fuck it, YouTube, whatever. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> like, when are you? When other? What other time are you gonna have an opportunity where somebody comes to you, a strong man comes to you and asks you to be part of the circus? Like, you're so, not. Yeah. So I. Um, yeah, so I joined them, and I was kind of just like, I called myself the circus mama because I, I did, like, everything behind the scenes. Like, I would travel with them, and whatever they needed, I was there. Um, I would, you know, do the styling. I would cook. I would uh, help out on stage. I would, um, you know, be backstage handing off props, um, all sorts of stuff. So, what I mean, what did you notice were some essential personality traits of people that are you know, in the circus 24 seven. Uh, resourceful. Um, very resourceful. Okay. They're very resourceful, very adaptable. Uh, they have the, um, like they, they can go for long hours. They're like built like bricks. They're like, there's nothing that can phase them. <laughs> like they can, be, they can go from a party to a show, to another party, to a show without really sleeping. That's um, crazy. <laughs> Yeah, and it doesn't bother them. Like, after a, an all-nighter, I'm usually, like, a disaster, so I just don't do that. And they would do all-nighters, like, a week in a row. So then the – you were in the circus for, what, about a year, two years? Uh, yeah, maybe a little over a year. Okay, a little over a year. And then you decided to move to L.A. Yeah. So, I mean, that – what – kind of led to that whole process where you decided you were going to, because were you still modeling when you were doing the circus? Yeah, I was still modeling. I wasn't modeling as much because my focus was obviously like traveling with the circus. Got it. Got it. But um, it, was, it was paying the bills and more importantly, it was fun. Right, exactly. And I still, you know, I was, um, I was modeling full time technically still like that was my technical title, but I was traveling with them. And I, I like went to Sicily for modeling in that period of time. And, um, you know, I, I did like a full European tour while I was also working with the circus, but um, but my primary focus was the circus. Damn! So you, I mean, you really did it right. Yeah, I was, I was, uh, I was working hard. <laughs> so I, you know, the the reason I ask is because your fame, I, I would say, really um, multiplied when you did decide to make that move to L.A. So, yeah. I mean, had you been taking trips to, to do uh, photography in L.A.? What was your experience with Los Angeles at this point? Well, I had been doing some adult work, kind of like very small amounts of it here and there. Okay. Uh, just, yeah, just little things. And I was I would go down to L.A. Like, I have an agency, adult talent managers. They're incredible. Um, I'm still signed with them, even though I'm not shooting porn anymore. So whenever mm-hmm. they got me a job, um, I would come down to L.A., shoot, and then go home. Um, and then, yeah, I was living in Portland and I had broken up with the, the boyfriends and okay. I don't know, the circus had essentially disbanded at that point. I don't think they exist anymore. This um, disband, you got this disbanded theme going on. I know, I guess so. I, I break <laughs> up down, guys. I'm like, yo. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, no, so I, uh, I left and then the circus kind of just like dissipated. Um, so I don't know what happened there, but, well, I do, but we won't get into that. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and I thought, you know, what the hell? Like, I'm going to move to L.A. and become a porn star. So you come out here and you start doing that, and Penthouse discovered you fairly shortly thereafter. Almost right away. Uh, I moved to port, or I moved to L.A. Um, and, yeah, started doing um, just some small stuff. And then mm-hmm. uh, Penthouse found me and um, – that was that like it, it kind of like shot me up pretty far like right away yeah because you were one of the penthouse pets of um 
I mean, you were one of the penthouse pets like that qualified for the year. Yeah, I was the runner-up for 2018. That's crazy. That's I mean, to just think that you arrive in L.A. and then so quickly thereafter you're able to to get that kind of acknowledgement. Right. That was awesome. I had I had no expectations that that was going to happen, and so it was like I mean, there's so many beautiful women in the industry, you know. So. It and and there's so many that want to get into that, you know. And so many women who are beautiful and have been in the industry for a long time working very hard for what they saw that I got very easily. Mm-hmm. So it also kind of like made a couple of people mad. But what can you do? I'm not going to turn Yeah, down. that's not your fault. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and resentment doesn't get anybody anywhere, you know. Exactly. So, yeah, so, it was a blast. And um, I got put on the map after that. And, um, I mean, I can basically thank Penthouse for, like, the rest of my Los Angeles career at this point. <laughs> well, the good thing, the good thing about it is it really allowed you to create your brand and especially with your art, cause you have incredible art and uh, you know, I definitely want you to mention uh, a, how people can view your art, but uh, more importantly, B how they can purchase it. And uh, you know, sometimes you do raffles for special causes. So I, you yeah. know, I want to, I want to go over that a little bit because it really did allow you to, to shape what you wanted this olive glass brand to become. Right. Well, that was something that when I moved to L.A. and I knew that porn was at this place in society right now where it was not um, viewed as badly, people were just starting to see it as, like, really exciting new celebrities, you know, and it gave these these people platforms that they wouldn't otherwise be able to access. So I was like, you know, I could create a platform for myself and a name for myself in like based on the porn industry like that could be my platform so I started using my like Instagram following to create nonprofit like a uh, charity fundraisers things like that um and yeah I mean you know people aren't as interested in like an Instagram model doing a fundraiser as they are in like a porn star doing a fundraiser right right I mean unfortunately but it it's just the way it is right. It's just the way it is. And so I was like, that is the best way to, like, maximize my platform. And also I was having a great time doing porn, whatever, you know. <laughs> yeah, hey, I mean, and, and you're retired from that now, though. Is that correct? That is true, yeah. Okay. And so you're pretty much able to focus 100% on creating what you want to create and putting it out there. Yeah. Um, that is, like, my, like, speaking of platforms, that is my entire platform at this point is that I create things. I create images where I'm modeling. I create images where I'm the photographer. I paint. Um, I I do a, I, I embroider. <laughs> I, I do everything. So uh, yeah, I I don't have a website for my art sales right now, but I okay. like if you just DM me on Instagram, I am available and I do a lot of sales through Instagram. So. Yeah, it's it's great, you know, in terms of really getting uh, your product out there to eyes that would never see it otherwise. You know, there's people probably buying internationally there are yeah um i think my favorite is some guy in um the netherlands like in this crazy place that i could never pronounce uh he he buys commissions from me all the time and um, yeah, see that's crazy that's so cool yeah somebody from china recently bought like a piece of wardrobe that i was selling so it's it's really cool when i'm sending packages to places that i have never been but like a piece of me is going there you know it's nice well, and that's just the thing is you really, since you were young, it seems like, is that you have been working on creating the path that, that you certainly weren't born into, but the path that you felt you deserved and the path that you felt meshed right with your, let's call it your spirit. Right. Like, I don't always, I don't always know where I'm going, but I know exactly what I want. And so I'm going to keep going until I get there. And yeah. And the thing is that, you know, on the, anyone that's that's on this this crazy journey of life, you know, we all have moments of struggle. We all have moments of adversity and I'm sure that you've faced loss and uh, you know, times where the foundation has been pulled out from under you. So what yeah. when you know, what would you say to someone who is trying to find their passion, trying to find their path but struggling to, you know, to find what it is? I guess, so when I'm painting, sometimes I'll get really frustrated and I won't know where to go or what to do with it. And then I remind myself that 
I need to stop trying so hard to make it happen mm. and just let it happen. And then that's how I finish most of my paintings now. And I think one thing I would tell people who are trying to find their passion, stop trying so hard and just let things, just examine what you do. Like observe yourself. What do you gravitate towards? And think outside the box a little bit, you know, like just you you have something that you're passionate about that you don't see yet, you know? Right. You're already right. doing. You just need to observe yourself observe yourself and see what it is you're passionate about. Once you get uh for a while when I, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I'm sorry, say again. Oh, one thing I did for a while actually, I was going through a bout of depression and so I started buying disposable cameras mm-hmm. and whenever I saw something that made me happy, no matter what it was, I would take a photo of it. That's cool. Yeah, and it I would get the photos back, and it would be, like, random shit that I don't even know, like, sometimes what it was. But all of a sudden, my focus was not on ruminating in my thoughts. It was take a photo of the thing that makes me happy. And so I was collecting all these moments of happiness, and it helped me find a new passion, a new motivation. Um, I really recommend that to anybody who needs to figure out what makes them happy and what makes them feel passionate. Yeah, you know, I I like the idea of creating things uh, when you are facing moments of adversity. I feel like if you can uh, create some music or make a you know do a drawing or you know this or do photography. There's uh, so many different ways that you can utilize uh, these creative outlets to to at least express that energy in in some kind of a positive way and get that off of your shoulders, get it out of your head. So that's, you know, something that I, I try to have us do here on the show is uh, if you go to sensoryshow.com, there's there's a little bit like an Easter egg button where if you are struggling right now, if you are in a moment where you're you're trapped in your thoughts, that uh, you could actually submit a drawing. What I like, uh, you know, listeners to do is draw it out. That could be an alien. That could be a monster. That could be any kind of cathartic feelings that you're having that you want to get down on paper, and you can submit them. There's There's a way to submit through the site. Uh, it's a little bit of a secret, so you've got to figure it out if you go on sensorytrail.com. <laughs> but also on our Instagram page at uh, at Radio Withdrawal, uh, if you do want to submit, and I'd love to have you submit something if you feel. Uh, oh, I'm doing that. You know, that would be <laughs> awesome. Yeah, that would be so cool. So if you go on uh, at Radio Withdrawal and just put extra hashtag extra sensory, so you'll be able to see olives, you'll be able to see any of the other listeners that are submitting, and that way, you know. It gives you something to do in that moment if you just you need a little bit of a, a respite, you need to have a little bit of an escape. But, you know, I think what you're doing, you've tapped into that the method that, that works best for you. You've tapped into that way to uh, to find relief, you know, when you when you do have, right. uh, you know, because uh, can you think of a time when you've had loss that you have you know really had to rely on this creativity to to get you back yeah uh when my mom was dying and i was taking care of her and it it like broke me you know and i was sitting outside of her door or i was sitting next to her as she was in bed all day every day for three months and i started painting and um that's what i did in between taking care of her and it was super hard but uh, i still have a lot of the artwork and um you know yeah I, i sent some of it to you like uh, just really finely detailed and um, very, like you can tell, I can tell at least there's like a lot of emotion going into it and I had to have something to focus on and I needed to create something good while I was sitting there because otherwise I was going to like lose my mind. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, so, you know, in moments of like extreme loss, there's no better way to channel your sanity than by creating something. And that's the reality is is that there's this this weird veil over the the word celebrity that you, it almost you know we see such small glimpses of of what the world is really like uh and you know there's like we were talking earlier there's so much that goes on behind the scenes and Absolutely. you know we all have these struggles we all deal with shitty days we all have ups and downs we all have times where we uh, tripped when we were trying to run and it's one of those things that uh we all deal with it and we, you know, have all different kinds of ways to get through it. And I think your ways is especially good because 
when you put it out there, you you can go back when times are better. You can look at it and say, "Well, yeah, wow, that was that was yep. exactly what was going on in that moment." And, and look where I'm at now because it does get better. And and you know, tomorrow is always another day. And right. even when you know, even when we doubt ourselves and when we're afraid to embrace ourselves, or when you know, when we're uh, too afraid to to move forward because we don't know if we're going to fail or not. You know, the reality is is that we all deal with this, and right. And it, sometimes we all fail too. But like, what are you going to do? You know, like you just got to pick yourself up and keep going because we're made of more grit than that. You know. Exactly. Well, like, so, you know, if if yeah. you had to tell yourself something today. If there's something that you feel like you need to hear, what would that be? As of today? Like right as now? Of right, yeah, as of right now. Um, that I need to stop procrastinating. <laughs> okay, okay, fair enough. Yeah, I mean, just like as a motivator for today, for me, stop procrastinating. <laughs> and how do you want to apply that? Well, procrastination is something that comes out of fear, you know, fear of failing. Mm-hmm. So I think uh, it really boils down to like, Fear of failure is really, really intense and very real to, like, everyone. There's nobody that you can look at who probably is, like, devoid of a fear of failure entirely, you know? And so I, I, I read this article recently that how procrastination is an, an anxious way of, of um, feeding into your fear of failure. So I work on uh, – I write lists now. Okay. Um, it sounds really type A, but it's actually – it works for me. So I'll write a list, and it will be – Everything I need to do in a day, literally, brush your teeth, get up, drink some tea, you know, like whatever, as well as the stuff that I actually like really need to get done. And my rule is that I can do this in any order I want as long as I get all of it done. So it's almost your way of adding a little structure to the chaos. Right. It's adding adding some structure but not too much so I don't get overwhelmed. I'm treating myself like a baby, essentially, but it, it works for me, so whatever. <laughs> well, I think that's a big part of, you know, combating, uh, you know, when you are facing uh, addiction or when you're facing depression. I think that uh, discipline plays such an important role that you have to have, you have to embrace it in some way. And even if it is, uh, you know, lists or or just positive affirmations, you know, these are things right. that, that really can help. Like, you need to be an adult for your, like, I mean, not to sound, you know, hippy-dippy, but, like, your inner child is just so extremely important, and um, you need to, like, take care of it, and I don't know, like, you need to be a disciplinary for your inner child, but also realize, especially if you're getting out of an addiction, that you are vulnerable, you are probably scared on some level, you are, like, there's so many upsets that are going on, and you need to be gentle with yourself. For sure. And, well, so... What if if you had to talk to someone who was suffering through something such as a loss or a horrible breakup or, you know, uh, terrible depression or addiction, if you had to share just a few thoughts of, uh, you know, helpful advice from your own life, what do you think that would be? So if I want to give people advice on how to, like, get out of their shell, essentially. Yeah, that as well, for sure. Yeah, um, I guess it goes along with everything else, like access that part of yourself that is is gritty and resourceful. And uh, I, I feel like personally when I get some isolation and I'm able to like think clearly and be on my own and relax like self-care, it's, it sounds cliche, but it's very important. Like take a bath, um, put on some good music, like get some yummy food. Food is, like, amazing. (laughs) For sure. Oh, for sure. Eat something that you love, and it's kind of like, if you're having, like, a really difficult moment where you think you're going to break, like, get some food, (laughs) like a burger or something. And, um, yeah, create some art. Like, just take it easy and don't, yeah, just don't beat yourself up, but also know that, you know, you need to set some structure in your life. Well, I think the one thing that I've also learned about about your journey is that a very critically important thing is that you always believed that things were going to get better as you were on this journey. You know, you always had kind of that end game in mind. You might not have known precisely where it was going, but you knew that something was going somewhere and it was going in a beneficial way. Right. Well, you have to have hope. Right, right. 
like you you need to focus on the the hope the that idea of like you know when you were I I made myself a promise when I was in second grade that I would never give up my imagination even when I got older and I remember sitting myself down and being like I can never become that adult that forgets what it's like to be in second grade and like be so hopeful and happy and like full of imagination and um which I think was a kind of a weird thing for a second grader to do, but, but yeah, it's um, deep, man. Yeah, I was a I was a pretty intense little kid, <laughs> um, and I, I've never forgotten that. Like, you need to know how to play. Like, you need to know how to imagine what your life could be if you were a fairy princess or like something really outrageous. But also, like, it accesses that part of your brain where you are in charge. You are full of hope. You are seeing the world how you want to see it. And there's literally nothing more important in a person's life than just finding that part of yourself that, like, loves life and wants to create something beautiful for your own self. Well, I think, you know, I I have a a little bit of a favor to ask since you do do those wonderful uh, uh, raffles every couple of months with with your artwork. I would love to have something set up where we could uh, have you choose a piece of art and and do a raffle where we could uh, have people contribute to like addiction services, mental health services, yeah. something like that. You know what I mean? I love that. Yeah. I think that would be so cool, and it, you know, it would really uh, put our money where our mouth is, kind of thing. I would love that. I mean, I you know, I have a history of a family that struggles with addiction, and I just think that you know, there's there's such beautiful people inside of that addiction. <laughs> Absolutely. And the addiction is not, I mean, it's not you, your life, you know, it's, it's, it's it can be such a small blip to you. It's not who you are. Absolutely. And, and it's, I, yeah, it's discovering who you are through, you know, these processes. And like you said, this is what's worked for you. And I think that it really could work for a lot of people. Yeah, I, I think so too. So let's very do that. cool. Let's, uh, well, yeah, let's, uh, let's make a fundraiser. That sounds good. I'm really excited about that. So, uh, you know what? I got to say, I think that uh, you should be so, so happy with, you know, what you've achieved and especially in the time that you've achieved it. I mean, it's it's Thank so you. cool that you have have come from a situation that could have played out so differently, you know, and the fact that you really figured out how to how to hustle and how to learn these things on your own and become this person that, you know, uh, battled her way to what her goal was and what her dream was, you know, that you just, that's inspiring. Thank you. I'm still working on it every day, but I think it's only going to be up from here. (laughs) Awesome. Well, look, I really appreciate you being on the show. I I cannot thank you enough. I I love what you've shared and and thank you for opening up about that. So definitely want to give some love to Olive Glass. Thank you again. Thank you. Yeah, uh, find me on Instagram, Glass Olive. And thank you so much for having me on the show. It was such a pleasure.